So you've been buying Bitcoin and doing the right thing by taking it into self custody regularly. However, did you know you could be setting yourself up for a shock when you go to move your Bitcoin later and are faced with hundreds, if not thousands of dollars worth of fees? Today, we're going to take a look at how to avoid this problem by utilizing something known as UTXO management. I am Ben with the BTC Sessions. This is your daily session. Bitcoin. For help with this and any other Bitcoin related topics, you can reach out to me and book me for one on one private education sessions at my website, btcsessions.ca. Shout out to sponsors of the show before we dive in hodlhodl.com. If you are buying Bitcoin and you have some priorities in mind like peer to peer trading, instant self custody, and no KYC, this is the place to go. You can sign up with nothing more than an email address. Once you're in, choose your currency, payment method, and an amount, and you can start browsing offers immediately. They also have peer to peer lending with no rehypothecation. Check them out today. Links are down below. Now, when you do stack some non-KYC sats, CoinKite has you covered with some of the best hardware on the market. Of course, you guys know I love my cold card Mark IV. I have all their other goodies like tap signers, sats cards, block clocks, you name it. I've pretty much got it. And I've also pre-ordered the hell out of the cold card queue. If you want to reserve one or if you want to pick up anything else I mentioned, head to CoinKite.com, use code BTC Sessions for a heavy discount at checkout. Now, backups are also important. Cedor has one of the most robust and beautifully designed steel backups on the market. This has a disc and capsule design. Their starter set comes with everything you need to get started with one or two seeds. And should you ever need to swap out your seed words, you can simply get more discs and not have to replace the entire system. You can check them out at cedor.io. And I have specific links depending on where you're shipping to in the show notes down below. Now, Nunchuck has you covered for your assisted multi-sig needs. These guys, they basically get you set up very simply on your mobile device. Once you're set up with your multi-sig, you will hold three keys. They will hold one. In this situation, you now have your peace of mind so that your sats can get to your next of kin should anything happen to you because they have baked in inheritance planning. And one of my favorite things about them is that the whole thing is no KYC, meaning you don't need to give up your private information to set it up and have it work for you. I've done a full tutorial you can check out and you can head over to nunchuck.io to learn more. And finally, shout out to Start9, your sovereign computing solution. These guys sell plug and play devices to run your Bitcoin and personal data stack. So this includes things like Bitcoin Core, your Lightning Node, mempool.space, join market, as well as things like files, passwords, photos, Nostra relays and clients, AI clients, all kinds of stuff that you can run in your own home. They have devices starting from entry level all the way up to what I'm running, which is the Start9 Server Pure. You can check them out at start9.com. And with that, let's dive into the tutorial. So let's start with prerequisites. What are you going to need to know to successfully navigate through this video? I am making a little bit of an assumption here that you have already purchased some Bitcoin and taken self custody of it. However, if you are not in that camp, this video can later be used to help you form good habits for when you are purchasing and taking self custody of your Bitcoin. But you will likely need to go back and learn how to one buy Bitcoin and two get your own wallet. The wallets that I use in this video, I will have links for down below so that you can go through full tutorials of them as well, if need be. Um, and I'll make some generalizations of how this might work in the wallets that you are using if they are not the ones in this video. So more or less, all you need to know is how to do some basic Bitcoin transactions. And we'll say it's a definite bonus if you have used Sparrow Wallet before, but not fully necessary because I'll try to explain what's in front of us as we reach those points. First things first, let's talk about how Bitcoin transaction fees are determined. It's pretty much two factors that come into play here. Number one is 
How busy is the network? How many people are trying to send their transactions simultaneously at any given time? And number two is how much data does your transaction require to be sent? What does not factor in is what is the monetary value that you're trying to send? So in some instances, you may have a very low value transaction or a very high value transaction, you know, maybe 50 bucks or a billion dollars. And in some instances, those two transactions would pay the exact same transaction fee. So it is not a factor of how much money you're trying to send. It is a factor of how much data and how busy the network is. Now, the Bitcoin network by design is meant to only handle a certain amount of data every 10 minutes. This is so that the amount of data to hold the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't become so large that the average person can no longer do it and then become centralized into data centers, which can then be co-opted and have the rules of Bitcoin change. It's, it's basically meant to mitigate centralization. But with that comes a cost, and the cost is transaction fees. Now, how fees work is anytime you send a Bitcoin transaction, you get to choose your fee. However, there's no guarantee that your transaction will go through quickly. You may be stuck waiting in line if you attach a low fee until the high fee transactions go through first, and then you're next in line and your transaction will be relayed. In some instances, if you set too low of a fee, your transaction will never be picked up potentially and will just revert back to the sending wallet. And so what you're dealing with here is at times when it's very, very busy and you have transactions that are heavy on data, well, then you can get into a situation where your transaction fee can be very expensive regardless of the amount you're trying to send. Now let's combine two concepts here uh, to kind of flesh out how this whole video is going to kind of play together and give you a better understanding of what we're actually accomplishing with UTXO management and consolidation. So first off, what is a UTXO? Basically, whenever you receive Bitcoin into a Bitcoin wallet, it is not just a balance. It's not just a number that changes. It's more like receiving cash. If you think about having a physical wallet and somebody handing you a $10 bill and a $5 bill and a $20 bill, all of those bills, when you look into your wallet, are discernible pieces. You can see the 20, the 10, and the 5. All of them are in front of you, but you can actually pick them out one at a time. The same is true of Bitcoin. Now, it's not set denominations. Obviously, you can receive any amount of Bitcoin, but when you receive it into your wallet, Whatever the amount was that you just received sits there as a discernible chunk of Bitcoin, and that is a UTXO. It stands for Unspent Transaction Output. And so every time you receive, you're having another UTXO sitting in your wallet, all of which you can actually see. Perhaps not if you don't have a great Bitcoin wallet that doesn't give that functionality, but the ones we're going to look at today do. They actually have a section where you can see the individual UTXOs, but you can also just see a general balance. And so the difference when it comes to Bitcoin and cash is that when you have your wallet with cash and you go to spend it, you pull out, say, a couple of bills and go to spend them in concert. And then somebody has to go into their own change to give you back change from money they already had uh, in order to give you any change that you uh, deserve. And furthermore, those separate bills, when you go to spend them, obviously stay as separate bills. If I, if I go to spend $32 out of the 35 that I had, well, I grab my 20, my 10, and my five, I hand them all over, and then somebody would have to fish around in their pocket for $3 worth of change to give back to me. But they still have a 20, a 10, and a 5. With Bitcoin, a little bit different when it comes to spending. You can think of all of these UTXOs more like gold coins. And what happens when I go to spend that $32 worth of my $35, it's 
kind of like I melted down all of those gold coins worth that certain amount. And then I split them up into a chunk of $32 for the recipient I'm sending to and $3 for my change. And so that person that's receiving that Bitcoin gets exactly the amount as a single UTXO into their wallet. And I get the remainder back to me as a UTXO for a smaller amount, assuming that there is change involved with the transaction. Now, outside of this, there's also a fee that gets paid to miners, and that's what comes into play when you're sending your transactions. So how do UTXOs play into potentially giving you much higher fees in the future if you don't maintain them properly? Well, the best analogy I can think of is imagine if there was a tiny fee based on every bill that you spent in a cash transaction. It would mean that going to spend a $20 bill would be much more efficient than spending a bunch of $1 bills all at the same time because each one of those bills has a little fee attached. You may as well spend the larger bill and have a single fee instead of 20 individual bills, 20xing your fees. And this is how Bitcoin works because each UTXO requires additional data when sending your transaction. And so if you've been loading up a wallet with 20 bucks, 50 bucks at a time worth of Bitcoin, and then down the road you go to send $2,000. All of a sudden, you're looking at tens, or in some cases, I've seen hundreds of UTXOs all trying to be sent at the same time, each one of those requiring little bits of data that need to be relayed on the network. If the fees, even if the fees are relatively reasonable, that can add up to a very hefty transaction fee. If the fees are higher at the time because more people are using the network, it can be a veritable nightmare. And so how do we mitigate this risk? Well, you can utilize something called UTXO consolidation. And what this is, is effectively sending your own Bitcoin to yourself in a transaction. And with that gold coin analogy, melting all of your UTXOs down from coins into a big gold bar that you then keep in the exact same wallet. It's effectively going into your wallet and saying, this address is mine. It's one of the Bitcoin addresses I own. I'm going to take all of these little UTXOs that have built up and I'm going to send them all to this address. And that melts them down, turns them into one big gold bar and sits it safely still within your own custody. It never leaves your custody in that process. So we're going to now dive into a Bitcoin wallet. We're going to take a look at what it looks like to go and see your UTXOs. And then we're going to go through the consolidation process and we'll detail how it might look differently using different wallets. So here we are in Sparrow Wallet for desktop. Now, um, I, I will include a full tutorial of Sparrow Wallet in the show notes down below. And also, before you get excited, this is a wallet that in its current settings, how I have it set up right now, is in testnet, which means that the balance you're looking at right now is not real. Um, these are testnet coins which have no monetary value, but allow you to test things and learn how things work before you deal with real value. So. Uh, these are, these are not real coins that are sitting here. Although that would be nice. It'd be pretty nice to have that wallet sitting there right now. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's just kind of get our bearings here and see what we're looking at. Now, some of you will likely be dealing with wallets that do not give you as many bells and whistles as Sparrow Wallet. I encourage you to try Sparrow Wallet out. It is fantastic. It has so much stuff baked into it it's impressive and on top of that it works with pretty much any hardware wallet that you may have or like all of the ones that are worthwhile in my opinion um and it gives you additional control with things like your utxo so you can 
actually accurately see what's going on and fully take control of that. And so what we have here on the transaction page is kind of your, your main home base. It tells you your balance. It gives you a, a dollar balance roughly that it calculates there. Um, and then it also gives you underneath that says mempool, which means what portion of your balance is in the midst of being confirmed or being mined, as in what incoming transactions do you have? And then down below, we have a list of transactions that have historically taken place with dates and, and all of that and any labels that you may have attached. So this is kind of what you might see in a different form in a lot of Bitcoin wallets, a general balance and some previous transactions. We also have send and receive screens and everything. But what I want to show you that a lot of Bitcoin wallets will not show you is your UTXOs. And so we're going to click on that tab over on the left hand side. What this shows me is all of the individual chunks of Bitcoin that are sitting in the wallet. So you can see here, I've got a chunk of Bitcoin right here um, that is in and around just over six Bitcoin. Um, and again, testnet coins. And then I also have a few other uh, UTXOs here. Here's one for 0 0.49. Here is one for uh, 0.005 and so on and so forth. So I have a whole bunch of different pieces of Bitcoin sitting in my wallet, but I can see that these pieces are discernible just like regular bills in my wallet would look like as cash. Okay. Now, um, don't worry about these little exclamation points. It just lets you know when you've used a duplicate address to receive Bitcoin. So if you see those in your own wallet, privacy wise is not the best practice, but um, you know, it's always good to use a new uh, receive address every single time. So what does it look like to uh, consolidate UTXOs in Sparrow Wallet? Well, there's kind of two ways you can go about it. You can consolidate everything all at once, and there are trade-offs there. We'll discuss those later. Or you can select specific UTXOs to consolidate. And so let's take a look at what it would look like if I wanted to specifically, we'll say, melt down two UTXOs into one chunk. OK, so here I can select one and then uh, I'm on a Mac, so I'm holding the command key, but it may be I'm not sure what it is on Windows, but shift or something like that. Anyways, you can you can select multiple ones uh, or if I wanted to select all, there is a select all button at the bottom. Either way, I'm going to select which ones I want to consolidate. Uh, I actually want to for this example, let's just do the bottom two. OK. Now, what I'm going to do here, now that I've selected them, there's a button that says send selected. I'm going to click that and it's going to take me to my send screen. Now, there's a whole bunch of different um, things on the screen here to pay attention to. But basically, we want to send them to ourselves. Uh, and in Sparrow, it actually has this cool built in thing where in the pay to field where you would paste a Bitcoin address, your own Bitcoin address for this function. There's actually a drop down arrow and it shows me the name of my wallet and in brackets it says consolidation. So you can just use this feature within Sparrow to consolidate very simply. So you click on that, it's going to serve you up a Bitcoin address that belongs to you. If you want to be really certain that it belongs to you, you can actually go to the addresses tab. I'll make note of the last few digits, Z V. W or Z V D W. And I'm going to go to addresses and I can see that one right there, Z V D W. So that is indeed one of my addresses. So back on the send screen, uh, I'm now going to give this transaction a label. I'm just going to say console or consolidation. I'll just leave it short. And it tells me, hey, this is the amount that you're sending. This is how much Bitcoin. If you use the maximum amount of the two pieces that you selected, which if you're consolidating is probably what you want to do. At this point, I'm now going to select the fee that I'd like to attach to this transaction. Now we are in testnet for this video. So that means that the, uh, the priority ranking of my transaction, meaning like how high of a fee do I need to attach in order for this to go through quickly is completely different than the reality of the actual Bitcoin network. Here, one sat per byte, 
gets me through in the next block. If you tried to do a fee this low that was like eight cents on the regular Bitcoin network right now, um, it just wouldn't go through. It, it would never get mined or, or it probably will never get mined, I would say. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, you would slide your fee accordingly to what you want to do. So just as an example, maybe I said two sats per byte or something, which would still be an absolute dream today. Nonetheless, uh, okay, so you set your fee just with the slider. You slide it up and down until you see that it's going to go through in a reasonable amount of time. Set it to medium or, you know, just... Ab, you know, low, you're, you're kind of trying to find that sweet spot of where it's going to go through based on when you need to use it and you won't be waiting too long. So either way, I've now set that. I put in an address, which we use the dropdown. I gave it a label. I see the amount that was automatic because we already selected which UTXOs we want. I set my fee. It gives me a little flow of what's actually going to happen. And so this is where we see the UTXOs actually in practice. So I can see I had a UTXO here, which was 125,000 sats. I had another UTXO here, which was 100,000 sats. Those two pieces are melting down and coming together. And they are splitting into the big chunk that is going to me. That is going to be a total of 224,000 some odd sats. And then the fee that is going to the miners, which in this instance is quite low because the fees on testnet are are nothing basically so either way this is kind of what this flow chart is going to look like in your wallet on sparrow but it gives us a nice visualization of what's actually happening with our utxos they're melting down and they're splitting into a big one for us and a smaller one for miners at this point General rule of thumb with Sparrow Wallet is when in doubt, hit the blue button. So in the bottom right, I'm going to hit create transaction. This gives us a summary. I hit the blue button to finalize. And then because this is a hot wallet, um, I don't have like a, a hardware wallet or something attached to this. I can just simply hit sign. If you're using a hardware wallet, there's going to be different steps to that. Go to my Sparrow video to see what that looks like. Either way, I'm going to hit sign. So basically, I've signed off on the transaction. This is okay to send. And then again, finally, blue button broadcast. This will then be sent off to the network. I get a notification and it does look a little funny when you send a consolidation transaction because your wallet knows that it's sending to itself. So all you see from your transaction history is the fee going out. You don't see anything else. It's not like you sent those 200 and some odd thousand sats, it's that I just sent the fee and nothing else exited my wallet. So it's going to look a little funny and I'll show you what that looks like. Now in Sparrow, every time you do a transaction, it creates a new tab for that thing. So I named it console. I can just X out of that tab because I'm done with that. You can see I'm back on my send screen, everything is, is wiped because I used the transaction and it gives me a fresh start. To see what I've just done, I can go back to transactions. And here's that transaction here. I can see it because the label there, it's unconfirmed. It's not fully mined yet, we'll say. Um, and you can see it just shows that there's a small amount of Bitcoin going out of my wallet. All right. And it shows my total balance then beside it. So it just shows the fee. It doesn't show the actual movement of funds because it stayed in my own wallet. Now, if we go back to UTXOs, what we'll see is... We have two less UTXOs that went out and we have a new one that is unconfirmed, uh, but still there for a larger amount. We now have a UTXO that is worth 224,000 sats roughly. And so we've melted down two pieces and we created one. So that is one instance of how to selectively do consolidation. But let's just say you, you just want to do the whole schwack of your UTXOs, consolidate them all down to one. How would you do that? Pretty simple. Go to your send screen, hit that drop down arrow, select consolidation. That's going to grab an address that you own. I'm going to do the same label because I'm doing the same thing. This time I'm going to hit the max button off to the right. That gives me my entire balance. I can then set my fee to whatever it's going to be, blah, blah, blah. Again, this gives me 
my flow chart of what's happening with my UTXOs. You can see I've got four of them, one, two, three, four. They're all melting down. They're creating one large one minus the fee going to miners. Blue buttons take us through. Oh, and we can see that old uh, transaction confirming, by the way. Either way, blue button, blue button, blue button, off it goes. As soon as we get this notification, which we just did, uh, again, and it's just the transaction fee going out, no change in our balance other than that. X out of the transaction. Let's go to our transaction screen. All right. So we see that again, minor fee going out. Our balance is similar to what it was minus that fee. And if we go to our UTXOs, we have one. We have melted down every piece of Bitcoin in our wallet into a single, we'll call it a big gold bar. And that's now sitting in our wallet. At no point did we have to send it out of the wallet and back in. We just sent it to ourselves to another address that we owned. And now we have a single piece of Bitcoin. What does this accomplish us, uh, accomplish for us as a reminder? Well, it means that the next time we go to send a transaction, we have this one piece of Bitcoin. And instead of having a bunch of small bills, of which every small bill that we're spending, every UTXO that we're spending requires data and thus requires more fees, we now have one piece of data that we are relaying. It makes it a lot more efficient. It cuts down on your fees substantially. And if you have a ton of UTXOs sitting, sitting in a wallet and you go to make any transaction that requires a lot of them all at once, that means that your fees will be higher. This is how you can mitigate it. Now, this is the, isn't the only thing you need to consider. Fees obviously are, are consideration, but so is privacy. So we're going to be talking a little bit about some of those trade-offs in a bit. Now, before we dive into those other topics, I do want to kind of draw comparisons of how this might look in a different wallet. And so Sparrow is very convenient in that it has that little drop down. Hey, uh, consolidate, send, and you're good to go. Other wallets may not give you that optionality. And so how might you do that in a scenario where that's the case? Well, to do it very simply, what you would do is you would go to whatever wallet you're using, you would hit receive, and you would grab your own address. You would copy it. Then you would go to whatever your send screen looks like, and you would paste that same address into your send field. If you have a label, you would add a label, whatever, uh, and then you would choose an amount and you would basically send everything, feasibly everything to that address if you're consolidating all of it. I'm assuming um, that a lot of wallets that are being used may not have uh, UTXO options where you can select your coins. There are some that do. Nunchuck on mobile is awesome for that. You can select your coins and all of that. So if you're using on-chain on mobile, Nunchuck is a, is a fantastic option. Um, but others will not include those awesome features. So just be aware that if you're trying to consolidate within an existing wallet, grab your own address and send your full balance to it. You can do a test transaction if you want with a smaller amount and then do the rest. But just be aware that uh, this is how the flow will go external to something like Sparrow or Nunchuck. Now let's dive into the privacy uh, aspect of consolidating UTXOs because this will be the number one trade-off that you are making in doing this. <clears throat> and so why is that? What are the privacy implications of consolidating UTXOs? Well, first of all, during the consolidation, any person that knows you owned any one of those pieces of Bitcoin will see it move together to a common address with all of those other UTXOs and become one. And so if you had somebody that had paid you, uh, you know, a, a small amount if they were looking on chain, they would be able to see that movement of funds. It wouldn't necessarily conclusively indicate that you own that Bitcoin because you could have sent it to somebody else who then, you know, consolidated or you could have been something else could have happened there. But 
it might give an indication to somebody. Somebody may conclude that. Um, the other privacy implication comes with spending after the fact. So let's say that you, you did this action. I'm going I'm to bring up this example in testnet uh, just to kind of show what I mean here. So this wallet, I've just consolidated all of these UTXOs into a single one worth about 6.6 .6 Bitcoin. Or on this screen at the time of recording this video, if this was real Bitcoin, it would be worth almost $310,000. Now, I want you to think of that analogy that I made earlier in and around. It's like a bill in your wallet. In this case, this is a single bill worth $310,000. Now, think of the act of paying for something with cash at a merchant. If I were to pull out a bill worth a certain amount and pay for something, the merchant doesn't just see the amount coming through for the, the item that I've purchased. Like if I buy a $50 pair of pants or something like that, they don't just see the $50 I spent, they see the change, right? Because the there is change made from that transaction. And so in that instance, if I used this UTXO to pay for a $50 pair of pants, I've now made that merchant privy to the fact that I own $310,000 worth of Bitcoin in that moment. And that is true whether it's a brick and mortar store or whether it's an online store that then ships you something or whatever it may be. Whoever the recipient of that transaction is, they can see the UTXO that they were paid from. And if you're paying an online merchant and that merchant is shipping you something, they now also have your home address. And so I'm sure you're beginning to piece together like, oh, wow, that's not ideal. Because if somebody sees that I've paid for a $50 pair of pants uh, with a bill that was worth $310,000, they may start thinking that uh, after they ship my item, they're also going to go buy a plane ticket and come to my home. <laughs> so it's important to keep that in context and around that. Um, now, some of the mitigation techniques that you can try to strike a balance with is purposely setting the threshold or the size of the UTXOs that you have. Uh, and so perhaps you only want to have UTXOs uh, of a million sats, which at the time of recording this video would be in and around $470 or something, something like that, something to that effect. So in, in that instance, it's not a big deal if I buy a $50 pair of pants and you know, somebody sees that, oh, he's got around 500 bucks and, and don't decisively know everything else. That's OK. Um, but you, you don't want to be flaunting your net worth every time you buy a candy bar. Not that you would necessarily buy a candy bar on chain, but you get you get my drift here. So UTXO size does play uh, a, a part in preserving privacy, but it is also a factor of what kind of fees do you want to uh, be paying as well. And so there's a balance to be struck as to what type of purchases do you picture making in the future and what size of quote unquote bills, AKA UTXOs, do you anticipate needing based on what the price of Bitcoin might do? Now, there are other things that I'll talk about in final thoughts here in and around how this may look in the future, because this is basically just accounting for the now of Bitcoin, but take that into account. Realize that with UTXO consolidation to save on fees, there is a privacy trade off that is made. So let's briefly touch on recommended UTXO sizes. What is the ideal size of a UTXO that you should store in your wallet? Well, I'd say. Based on some of the fees that we've seen over the past year or so, where they could be, you know, in the next little bit, by the way, I'm filming this in early of 2024, um, 
It's advisable to have UTXOs that are at least 1 million sats or 0.01 Bitcoin in size. As, re as of recording this, Bitcoin's around $47,000, so that's $470 in that single UTXO. Now, that's not to say that you, you um, can only spend Bitcoin in $470 chunks. Of course, there are layers and tools and stuff like that in and around Bitcoin that you can use for much smaller value transactions. We'll touch on that in the final thoughts. But in terms of on-chain, those size of chunks of Bitcoin, those UTXOs should probably be in and around a million sats and beyond. When you start getting too small of a UTXO, you run the risk of a substantial portion of that being eaten up in fees to make a transaction. And in some cases, the UTXO may become unspendable. Now, how is that possible? How could a UTXO be unspendable? When I say unspendable, maybe that's not the best word for it. It just means that it's economically infeasible. It means that the fee attached to it will be worth more than the UTXO value. And, and so how that would work would be no matter what, a UTXO takes a certain amount of data in order to send that transaction. Even if you've only got one, there's still a certain amount of data that is required to relay that transaction. Now, transaction fees are dictated by, again, how much data and how busy is the network? What are people bidding uh, as they freely choose their fees? And so... That is measured as sats per byte. How many sats are you willing to spend per byte of data that you are relaying? And so if you have a UTXO, that UTXO requires a certain number of bytes of data to be relayed, uh, and you have a sats per byte denomination that the number of sats paid times the number of bytes of data that your transaction requires, if that number equals more than the UTXO is worth, then you're in a situation where it's effectively unspendable. And it wouldn't matter if you added more UTXOs to the mix, that particular UTXO and anything below that size, they're all unspendable. Because even if you add another of the same size, it adds enough fees to completely undo the value you've added to the transaction. So this is where you need to be conscientious and understand that UTXOs need to be a certain size to be economically feasible. No matter what, if you've got a UTXO that's like 5,000 sats right now, it is unspendable in the current fee environment. There, Even if you added it to a larger transaction, you're paying more in fees to add it than any value that will get through. So you may as just well not add it at all. And so this is kind of the balance that uh, you need to strike a big enough UTXO to make it economically feasible um, in order to do on-chain movements with it. And it's not too large that it would compromise so much privacy that you would be worried that somebody knows you have it. So again, a million sats plus in the current environment probably makes sense. But we'll talk about day-to-day -day spending in final thoughts here. So I want to also offer you guys some awesome tools that can help you along your journey as you're kind of utilizing and understanding UTXO management. Um, first of which is going to be a website that can help you better discern fees. Now, if you're utilizing... Um, uh, Sparrow Wallet, this is where their, um, their transaction fee slider rates are coming from in terms of advising you what is high priority versus low priority. Uh, but this is mempool.space and it gives you a, a, a picture of what the current fee environment is at any one time. On the right, you see blocks of transactions that have been mined by miners and are now added to the Bitcoin blockchain. On the left, you see blocks of transactions waiting to be mined. And uh, I guess the important part for you would be at the top of each block, there is um, an estimated fee required to get into or guarantee that you get into that block. And so we see the next block waiting in line 
you would have to attach a fee of at or above 110 sats per byte per v byte uh, of data in order to successfully make it into that block guaranteed. Now, it might be less, it may be more, but you know, at this very moment in time, that's what it's telling you. And below there, you can see the stretch of different fees that have been added uh, to various transactions sitting in this block that are waiting. So we can see fees have been paid at a rate of between 104 and 667 sats per V-byte. Of course, somebody probably fat fingered that. There's no reason to pay six times the fee rate to get into the next block, but these things happen sometimes. Down below, you can get a, just a general overview of what the situation is. So you can see high priority, next block, now says 111 sats per V-byte. Medium priority is 103, and low priority is 89. And then it says no priority, but it may get through at some point, is 48. And then it does have a generalized uh, estimate of what that dollar value is in US dollars just underneath those fee rates. So this is a very useful site for me if I'm ever using a wallet that is not Phoenix wallet, or sorry, if I'm ever using a wallet that is not Sparrow wallet, this is where I tend to look to kind of double check if their fee calculation is looking accurate or if I can maybe drop it a little bit because it's telling me something different here. I would, I would defer to this as my tool for that. Now, Beyond that, we we're talking about uh, ideal UTXO size, and from that, we dove into a section talking about UTXOs being too small to spend in some instances. Well, this tool uh, made by Jameson Lop, which I will link in the show notes down below, along with mempool.space, uh, he just made this tool not too long before I put together this video, and it's about economically unspendable Bitcoin UTXOs, and it gives you a calculator. So. Up at the top, you have a list of what type of Bitcoin addresses you're using. Now, there's different types of Bitcoin addresses. Some start with a one, some start with a three, some start with a BC1, and then there can be variations thereafter. And depending on the type of address you're actually using, that also can impact your fee. We didn't touch on this earlier, but it was a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Either way, you're going to want to get, at the very least, a, a Bitcoin address that starts with BC1 is going to be your most efficient way of using Bitcoin. Nonetheless, if you're unsure which script type to choose here that pertains to you, I'll also link this article from Unchained uh, that does a comparison of different Bitcoin addresses. And if you just scroll down to the bottom, um, it gives you uh, some overview of what the beginning of the address will look like. So you can see just across here, P2, P, K, H, uh, it starts with a one is the prefix, whereas P2, TR or pay to taproot starts with B, C, one, P. OK, so there's variations there, uh, but this is what you're kind of looking for. So how does this calculator work? Basically, you choose the type of address uh, that you're dealing with. So I'm going to go with uh, this one here, which is B, C, one. Um, and then it says, how many signatures are required? Like, is this a multi-sig or is this just a regular single sig? And I'm just going to say it's a regular single sig wallet. Now I'm going to hit calculate. And so what this will do, and you didn't see it there because I already had a chart up, but it, it calculates the trajectory of how much you're going to spend in fees versus what is the fee rate. OK, so basically I'm looking along the bottom and I'm saying, well, what is the current fee rate? Well, what is the current fee rate right now? It is, we'll say around 98 sats per byte, so around 100. OK, great. Well, I'll just slide along here and I can see at 100 sats per byte, any UTXO at or below 7,900 sats, because that's what my fee would be with that type of address, with this type of fee environment, anything at or below that is unspendable. The entire balance would go to minor fees. Anything above that would reach the destination. But also keep in mind, if it was double this, once that UTXO landed in the destination address, that one would now be unspendable. So it's, it's important to, to think about these things. Okay. But beyond that, you can see how very quickly 
if fees were to get really, really high, we, you know, I've recently seen them up in the 600 range at points. So let's go to 600. This was kind of the highest that I saw them around, but 47.4 thousand sats. So around 47,000 sats to send a transaction at that fee rate if it were to spike to that level. That means that anything in and around 50,000 sats is not spendable. And again, if you double that, after you spend it, if somebody then went to send that UTXO again later while the fees remained that high, they would also be faced with the fact that what they've received is likely unspendable. So this is why having large UTXOs as savings becomes very important and trying to use Bitcoin for tiny, tiny transactions does, is not economically feasible with the way that the, the network is, is constrained in and around data and fees and how that's structured. But it's a very useful tool. And I just want to show you kind of how the type of address can impact things. Um, and so, you know, let's go to the high end here. A thousand sats per byte would cost 79,000 sats to relay a transaction. And let's go to uh, the oldest and, and least efficient version, uh, P2PAH. So I'm going to do uh, that type of address. It starts with a one. I'm going to hit calculate. What did I say? 79,000? 158,000 sats to send from one of the old legacy addresses that starts with a one instead of a more efficient one. Yeah, basically you're, you're, cutting, you're cutting it in half by having a more efficient address type. So awesome tool. Recommend you check it out. Um, and it just kind of helps you quantify what you're, what you're dealing with there. And then finally, I want to give a shout out to uh, the guy who's been championing this um, far earlier than most other people. And he's got a lot of incredible content. This is an excellent subscribe on YouTube. Please tune in to Wicked Smart Bitcoin. Dude has a lot of great material uh, and, and can really help you with the tools and fine tuning your setup. Uh, he's done stuff on Sparrow Wallet, on, again, transaction or UTXO consolidation, and a whole bunch of other really cool things. I can't recommend it enough. Subscribe to Wicked. Uh, he's doing great work and I'll link that down below as well. Anyways, I hope these tools are helpful and uh, let's jump to some final thoughts. We are all right now witnessing the birth of a new monetary system. And that's very exciting. And a lot has happened in a short period of time since 2009 but a lot still has yet to happen. We've, we've basically experienced the foundation being forged and begun to see some tools be built atop that foundation. But that is just beginning. And so what we've basically been doing as individuals using Bitcoin right now is the equivalent of a global central bank settlement. That's kind of the, the best analogy that we have right now, or a settlement of, of gold between nations being, you know, that used to be brought by ship or plane around the globe. We're, we're effectively using that mechanism to pay each other for t-shirts and swag and different things. That is what we're doing right now. And some of us have moved on to subsequent layers that gives us, um, that allows us to be a little bit more nimble and have less fees and transact quickly um, with certain trade offs. So some people are using Lightning Network. Some people are using things like eCash, Xiaomi and eCash, uh, Cashew, Fediments, Liquid Network and various other things. And we're going to see more of those things pop up. Each one of them will have their certain sets of features and others will have big trade-offs. And it's going to be up to the individual to decide like, okay, well, I, I want to do a transaction or I want to do regular transactions of a certain size. 
it doesn't make sense for me to to spend x amount of sats on chain to do this it's not economically feasible so what tool am i going to use to execute those transactions and so yeah we are very much in 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 the midst of having having utilized the base monetary layer since inception and now for the first time individuals are regularly actually having to be conscious of how efficient they are utilizing that base layer. And so this is going to be continuing to shift over time, how often you're using regular on-chain transactions versus other tools. And it's going to be a bit of a moving target because we're, we're so early into the birth of Bitcoin and, and the forging of this new monetary system that no one person can say for sure exactly what it's going to look like five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. And so I, I think at the end of the day, we just need to be nimble. We need to try and learn about these various tools while understanding the trade-offs. And then at the end of the day, try to use Bitcoin in the way that exposes us to the least counterparty risk at all times while balancing the ability to transact freely and efficiently peer to peer as best we can. That's kind of my take. I know the tools I'm currently using tend to shift as this, you know, reality kind of blossoms in front of me. I'll link a video below as to what my current flow is, and that may change over time. So I hope this video has been helpful. Let me know um, your experience with UTXO consolidation, um, some of the lessons learned in and around being efficient on chain, and perhaps even what tools that you're using outside of UTXO consolidation uh, to most efficiently use Bitcoin for your particular use case. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, please do like, subscribe, share, all those things, they help a ton. Getting this content in front of more eyeballs, hit that little like button below the screen, share this on whatever socials you may be on, and of course, hit that subscribe button. I am on the warpath to 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2024, so if you could help me out, that would be awesome. Uh, also, if you need one-on-one -on -one help with this topic or any other Bitcoin related topic, please reach out to me via my website, btcsessions.ca. That's where you can book me for one-on-one -on -one sessions. If you need some whole extra hand-holding, maybe those tutorials, and there's a lot of them, so dive in. But if those tutorials need a personal touch and you need that one-on-one -on -one experience, then of course you can do it there. Of course, if you want to help the show in another way, you can hit up the previously mentioned sponsors in the show notes down below. Those were Hoddle Hoddle, CoinKite, Cedar, Nunchuck, and Start9. And uh, with that, I am out. Have yourselves a wonderful day or evening, wherever you may be. See you guys next time for your daily session. Hoddle the Bitcoin.